Hello, and welcome to chapter 12 of our Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe read-through. I'm Jem, the reader at St John the Baptist Parish Church in Beeston, and the chapter we'll be looking at this time is Peter's First Battle. If you haven't read it, do so by all means. It runs from while the dwarf and the white witch were saying this, miles away the beavers and the children are walking hour upon hour into what seemed a delicious dream, and it runs to, and whatever happens, never forget to wipe your sword. So this chapter involves uh, the characters walking towards the stone table uh, as part of the sort of race they've been having with the White Witch. They meet Aslan finally. Aslan and Peter look at each other in a very uh, theologically charged moment. And then Aslan takes Peter and shows him the land that he's going to be a uh, high king of um, and shows him Care Paravella in the distance. And then... Malgrim the wolf attacks uh, the camp and Peter fights him and kills him, hence the title Peter's First Battle. It's an action-packed chapter, perhaps particularly when compared to the last one, which as I talked about is, is packed with symbolism and seems to me to be a series of images and references rather than definitely a sort of more, more driving plot. But again here I think there are symbolic resonances. It seems very striking to me that in the, the travel section at the beginning, when there's a more general description of the spring and how lovely it is and all the, the trees uh, and how nice it is and how they realise that this is going to stop the witch's sledge because the snow is going away. Um, it's quite specific, the direction they're travelling in. Now, Lewis is not a great systematizer in fantasy in the same way that Tolkien is. He doesn't have necessarily a sense of the prehistory of this world and its economics and its social organisation, which sometimes Tolkien seems to know all about, including its, its linguistics um, and its politics. But they're quite specific about the direction that's being travelled here. They had left the course of the Big River some time ago, but one had to turn a little to the right, that meant a little to the south, to reach the place of the stone table. Even if this had not been their way, they couldn't have kept the river, river valley once the thaw began, for with all that melting snow, the river was soon in flood, a wonderful, roaring, thundering yellow flood, and their path would have been underwater. Now, as I've said before, there are very few words wasted in this relatively short novel, and I was really interested in the fact that it said, well, I had to turn a little to the right. That meant a little to the south. So we're, we're told specifically that they're travelling from west to east, um, because that's, that's the direction you'd be travelling if the south was on your right. Uh, and later there... They were on a green open space from which you could look down on the forest spreading as far as one could see in every direction, except right ahead. There, far to the east, again, the east is in front of them, was something twinkling and moving. By gum whispered Peter to Susan, the sea. In the very middle of this open hilltop was the stone table. It was a great grim slab of grey stone supported on four upright stones. It looked very odd and it was cut all over with strange lines and figures that might be the letters of an unknown language. They gave you a curious feeling when you looked at them and then they're going to see the, the camp of Aslan um, with his followers. But I was interested in the fact that, that there, there's so much is made of the travelling here, that they wander through this landscape, and it describes it as they're tired, but they're sort of lethargic and in a dream rather than being bitterly tired and, and tormented or in pain. And they're going east. Now, east is important uh, for the Narnian cosmology because uh, Aslan arrives uh, over the sea from the east. Uh, he's the the son of the emperor beyond the sea, as he's called. And when we meet Reaper Cheap in the tale of the Dawn Treader, there's uh, a song that was spoken over him um, saying that uh, he should travel to the Utter East and there he'll find all he seeks. And, and he disappears into the Utter East at the end of that novel. Again, spoilers, apologies. <laughs> so the East is significant. And it's, there also seems to be a significance of space and time that's being mapped onto this journey because they're travelling from having met Father Christmas and realising that spring is beginning, and they're travelling to the east, to this place where they're going to meet Aslan. Now, I don't think it's too fanciful. In fact, I don't think it's fanciful at all. It suggests that they are on a liturgical and a biblical journey. They are travelling, though they don't know it. They're travelling in this extraordinary dream where life is starting to burgeon around them, towards Easter, after all. They've just met Father Christmas, and they're travelling to, to the east from left to right, the way we read along a page. And though they don't know it, they're travelling towards the events that are going to produce the, the Easter of this world. And there's something, I don't know, 
plangent about that. Because as far as they know, they're travelling towards salvation and joy. And they are. But they don't know about what's going to happen between them and that happening. Um, they, they, they're in a way, they're travelling through Lent. But they don't know it yet. Um, and as, as life is burgeoning and they're feeling joyful, they're travelling towards some momentous events that are hidden from them at the moment. It's also, a, I think, a biblical journey in that I think they're mimicking the journey to Jerusalem, um, where, where Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem and, and travels, and his disciples, again, don't know what's, what's going to happen, or uh, they're, they're not sure what's going to happen. Uh, Peter even tries to dissuade him. But there is a sense in, this, uh, in these chapters, and particularly, I think, of this chapter, that they're travelling towards somewhere where it's all going to come together, where something dramatic is going to happen. So I think we've got that, that biblical journey implicitly and that temporal liturgical journey where the, the months are blossoming, the spring is happening, and they're going towards this act of sacrifice and atonement. And when they get to the, the stone table, they're going to be talking a lot about the stone table, I suspect, over, over the next few chapters. It's one of Lewis's most dramatic and most complex symbols in the novel. Um, here I, I want to draw attention to an aspect of it that didn't strike me until I went for this this read through. I must admit, I've been so used to thinking about it in its metaphorical and symbolic terms, in terms of its religious uh, imagery, that it didn't occur to me what it actually looks like. In the very middle of this open hilltop was a stone table. It was a great grim slab of grey stone supported on four upright stones. It looked very old and it was cut all over with strange lines and figures that might be the letters of an unknown language. They gave you a curious feeling when you looked at them. It's Stonehenge, or if not that, it's a dolmen that you might find anywhere across uh, the British Isles or across Europe. Um, it's a collection of upright stones with a stone slab on the top. It's a prehistoric stone monument. It, this really surprised me, again, in, in that this is an explicitly Christian novel and its central symbol is something that we know is a, is a, a pagan uh, monument. Now, what stone circles like Castle Rig and Stonehenge were, people continue to, to debate and archaeologists continue to, to discover new things about them. Um, and in, particularly in the work of, of Ronald Hutton, there's been an interesting tracing of what people thought about them uh, throughout the, the centuries previously. In the, I remember reading that in the 17th century, uh, some people thought that Stonehenge was the great uh, mooting house, the great parliament uh, of the Anglo-Saxons, and that when they elected their kings, because they were a good, uh, a good, honest, liberty-loving Anglo-Saxon civilization, one man stood on each dolmen from each of the tribes and shouted out the name of who they wanted to elect as their paramount chief. Um, other people thought that the Druids had built them and thought that their terrible human sacrifices took place and that they drank blood and sacrificed their slaves and their wives. Um, uh, what, what you thought Stonehenge was, to a certain extent, if you were antiquarian or someone concerned with, with the long stretches of history in the British Isles, acted as a bit of an index to how you felt about the past. <laughs> Certainly, I think, up until um, the arrival of more scientific archaeology um, in the, the late 19th and early 20th century. So it, it struck me here that we, we have a definitely, a definitely pagan symbol here, a symbol that is associated with the, the pre-Christian landscape. Some people in, in the 19th century, in fact, did, did believe that um, it was it was post-Christian, that it was a Roman monument. But there was there was general agreement, certainly by the, the 20th century, that this is clearly um, a, a pagan uh, monument. And so it's interesting that he chooses this as the, the gathering place for perhaps the central act of the novel. And it goes back to that issue that, that I've spoken of before, where I think he's offering a comprehensiveness of vision. Um, this is a novel which, in its account of the Christian myth and the Christian uh, world story, the Christian uh, narrative, seeks to bring all things together and explain all things, not necessarily in a sort of uh, Kasorban-like key to all mythologies way, but it, it, it has a strong sense um, for Lewis, for someone who was fascinated and, and loved folklore and legend uh, of, the, of the British Isles and of the Mediterranean and of the northern European uh, countries, that if Christianity was, is to explain human life and human civilization, it must give account of all of these. Uh, it can't be just one particular nation's or one particular group's religious tradition and they don't look outside that. And it's true for them, but it's not so much true for other people. They've got their own kind of truth. You know, that was a, um, 
a religious sort of looking inwards that Lewis had no sympathy with. So yeah, he's, he, he boldly places this great pagan symbol uh, at the centre of his, um, uh, at the centre of his Christian novel. It's also, I think, part of something else that we've mentioned here, is it's part of the enchantment of the British landscape. These, after all, the, these uh, stone circles are places of profound mystery. We still, we still don't know all we'd like to know about them, but probably never will. Um, and certainly in the, in the 19th and, and early 20th centuries, they acted as uh, potent uh, focuses for people's speculation about the past, particularly the, the prehistoric past, the past beyond which the, uh, the things that can be spoken about um, lie. Uh, and so I think rather in the way that the, the fairy Pook appears in Puck of Pook's Hill um, or uh, the, the, the Piper at the Gates of Dawn, as we mentioned before, um, in The Wind of the Willows, this stands as an object of mystery, but a mystery that's bizarrely close. Rather as in in uh, the beginning of Tom Brown's school days, uh, Hughes berates the young men of today who'd rather travel in Switzerland or Germany or Italy rather than explore their own native counties where they might find things like the Blauen Stone. Um, there's a sense in which this this is a thing of immense antiquity and strangeness and otherness, but you might stumble across it wandering through a wood in England. You know, it might be just over the next hill. There's that as that dialectic of of presence, but also immense mystery. Um, so yeah, there's more to say about the the stone circle, no doubt, in later chapters. But that's the thing that particularly struck me when we first meet it here. Um, and it talks about cut all over with strange lines and figures that might be the letters of an unknown language. This is, of course, the case uh, about many standing stones um, in uh, in the British Isles. They do have uh, cut marks and um, squiggles uh, and zigzags and and sort of pock marks uh, that appear to have some ritual significance to them. So. Peter then uh, is the first one to approach Aslan. And there's, there's a really interesting moment here where he says, uh, we've come Aslan, and Aslan welcomes them. And Aslan says, but where is the fourth? He has tried to betray them and join the white witch, O Aslan, said Mr Beaver. And then something made Peter say, it was partly my fault, Aslan. I was angry with him, and I think that helped him to go wrong. And Aslan said nothing either to excuse Peter or to blame him but merely stood looking at him with his great unchanging eyes. And it seemed to all of them there was nothing to be said. Please, Aslan, said Lucy, can anything be done to save Edmund? All shall be done, said Aslan, but it may be harder than you think. And it's not the speech there that, that particularly struck me so much as the silence. Um, I'm certainly not the first person to, to point this out. Um, Rowan Williams has, has written particularly uh, illuminatingly on this, on the way in which people's uh, true, I don't know, facing of people's true experience of Aslan in these novels often comes in moments of aporia, moments of, of silence or, or lack of speech or things where everything has been said or there's nothing to be said. Uh, there, there's a sense in which, like experiences of the divine, these things are beyond words, that words can get us to the edge of, of that experience, but words cannot carry us forward. A very old tradition in Christianity. Obviously, there is the um, the via negativa, the apophatic way, uh, the way which uh, seeks to either exhaust speech or to to put away speech and put away concepts as a way of communion with the divine. Um, there's also specifically the, the question here that Peter has, in some sense, sinned. That it is a confession. He says, "I I was angry with him. I I think I think that helped him to go wrong." Earlier, I pointed out the fact that. Peter turns away from Edmund, that where Peter asks forgiveness from Lucy in this very English public school boy, says, will, will you shake hands? Oh, yes, of course I will, and they shake hands, and you know, and they, they cry packs, and all's fair, etc. Um, they, they don't quite sit down and have sandwiches and ginger beer, but it's something close to it. Um, and there's, there's, there's a moment of speechlessness there where, where Peter realises that Edmund has betrayed Lucy, and he says, of all the poisonous little... But obviously, he the tails off because... Peter either swears, or and the book doesn't want to say that, or Peter stops himself from swearing, or Peter simply can't find a word bad enough, and so turns away. And having himself just asked for forgiveness and, and received it doesn't really allow Edmund that chance um, to face up to his own sin and then to ask forgiveness for the community. And I've suggested that, that is a moment where Peter is so concerned to keep the family together and to, you know, to keep the siblings as a healthy community, and he fails there. And here he... 
he calls back to that moment. Um, he asks forgiveness, and he says that he, you know, he's he was angry with them. He showed him wrath rather than understanding, and he thinks that might have pushed him further away and and contributed to his sin. There's a sense then that that Edmund is obviously uh, doing wrong here. You know, he's he's the betrayer, but that the community itself is not unconnected with his sin. That when someone in the family goes astray that involves all of them somehow, even if it doesn't involve them in, in terms of guilt or in terms of intention. Um, but that, you know, in a rather Dunian way, no, no, no Pevensey is an island, we might say. Although I might be seem to, to be uh, anticipating Prince Caspian and various isthmus and peninsulas there. So as of this moment of there being nothing more to say, which again contrasts perhaps in a lighter way with Lucy's attempt to both excuse and blame Mr Tumnus, when he says, oh, I'm, I'm this terrible person. She says, oh, yes, you are, sort of, but it wasn't that bad, but maybe you shouldn't, you certainly shouldn't do it again, but aren't you sorry for it? Aslan simply knows that that words will not take them any further in this moment of, of aporia. And I'm interested that that happens just before he takes Peter uh, and shows him uh, Narnia and shows him Care Palavel and says, you're going you're gonna to rule here. Because Peter has shown a failure of some kind of kinship. He's, he's shown a, um, a failure of allowing uh, sin to be acknowledged and forgiveness to be uh, offered and peace and communion to be restored within the, the small kingdom of the Pevensey children. And so it's only after he's confessed his, specifically like his failure of, of kingship, his use of wrath rather than healing and peace, that he's taken and, and shown this, um, shown this uh, country that he's going to rule over. And again, it then interests me that this is the point at which he has his first battle. Um, I was pondering on this because it always seems to me a, an odd sort of jolt of, of styles. Um, we've got this looking out over this landscape and this rather sort of far-eyed, misty, destiny stuff. And then, then we're right up against it with a blade and a big hairy thing that's trying to, trying to kill you, you know, like, a, like an episode in Doom or, or Quake or something like that. Um, and that, that shift of, of tone surprised me. So as ever, I was looking for the symbolism. I, th I think apart from anything else, it's a, it's a good bit of adventure story writing, isn't it? You know, we, we've got this sense of, of destiny and significance, but destiny and significance is made up of individual hand-to-hand -hand actions, as we might just sort of say, both in the, in the spiritual life and in the adventure story. But I think there is a, 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 um, a connection here between these elements in that it's about kinds of kingship again, because Peter fights a wolf. And I thought, why wolves? Um, and he becomes Sir Peter Wolfsbane. Now, wolves are uh, a live matter in, um, in children's literature. There's obviously the wolves of Willoughby Chase. And the Box of Delights begins uh, with the, the idea that the wolves are running uh, and that, there's, that, that means that something is, something is going on, something is wrong. Um, they obviously have this place in the, the British imagination as this great great sort of super predator of, of humans that has disappeared. We don't have a, a myth or a legend like uh, St. Patrick and the Snakes. But I'm struck at the way children's literature, particularly of this period, looks back to the, the wild land of Britain. And one of the things that's in the wild land is the wolves. They're sort of the, the natural enemy of man in, in some sense. Um, and that they've been banished by, by industrialization and civilization and, and agrarian uh, life and that kind of thing. Uh, but there's also something biblical going on, I think, where the, the wolf is the natural enemy of the shepherd, um, of the pastoralist. You know, wolves come and steal sheep. Um, the worst kinds of pastors are wolves in sheep's clothing, you know, false prophets, people who seek to, to break in and devour the sheep. So when Peter fights a wolf, he's both back in the midst of the ancient British Isles, uh, having this archetypal fight between man and wolf. And I'm pretty sure there's at least one Rosemary Sutcliffe novel where uh, a Bronze Age or an Iron Age boy um, gets his, his sort of right of manhood by going on one-on-one -on -one with a wolf and killing it. I'm dashed if I can remember what it is, but there's certainly one novel, at least one novel where that happens. And he's also fighting out his right to be a true pastor, uh, a true shepherd. Um, he's, he's, his right to reflect the kinds of things that King David uh, did um, before he met Goliath and the kinds of things that Christ is spoken of, of doing as a protector of the sheep and those who imitate Christ should do. So I think there is a, a submerged strand of kinds of kingship going on here um, where having 
confess this failure and being shown his future uh, land, Peter then demonstrates his right to, or his, his ability to exercise that kind of kingship, that protective, peace-loving uh, kingship. Um, and here again, rather like Edmund's praying of mercy for other people and receiving physical chastisement because he seeks to save others um, from uh, their, their, what the Queen regards as their crime, or because we don't regard it as a crime. I think, again, here there is a small reflection in one of the Pevensies of these Aslan-like characteristics and these things that are going to be part of their, uh, part of coming to be who they truly should be uh, and who they're truly destined to be in their reflection um, of the presence of Aslan. So those are the, the things that uh, struck me this week. Um, I'd be really interested to hear what struck you. So please do uh, leave some comments below on, on whether you think I'm right or wrong or whether more likely just other things struck you, other things that you wanted to pick out. Our next chapter is called Deep Magic from the Dawn of Time, another great phrase that gets frequently quoted when people remember this novel. So it's Deep Magic from the Dawn of Time, and it goes from Now We Must Get Back to Edmund, all the way to And the witch, after staring for a moment with her lips wide apart, picked up her skirts and fairly ran for her life. I look forward to chatting to you about that. <laughs>